from the four lecture series in perioperative pain management. This is Dr. Abdullah Turkawi. I'm currently a pain management fellow at Stanford University. In this lecture, we're going to put the things that we learned in the last three lectures together and learn how to build a plan for pain management, individualized plan for pain management. And we're going to talk about multimodal analgesia, of course, and strategies to reduce perioperative opioid use. And finally, we're going to talk about management of pain in a resource limited setting. So consideration when formulating a plan for perioperative pain management. First, how much pain is associated with the surgical procedure and how long is it expected to last? Is the procedure amenable to the use of regional or local analgesic techniques? Are there particular patient factors that affect the choice of analgesic option? Specific regional analgesic technique like neuroaxial are contraindicated in the setting of abnormal coagulation or platelet dysfunction. Always involve the patient with the decision making and get the necessary information consent. Always have alternative plans. What if the epidural cannot be done? What if it's not successful? What's my other option? Always discuss with the surgeon and get them involved, try to understand about the surgery, and get involved in the pain management uh, planning. So approach for postoperative pain management. First, pain assessment. Make sure the patient has no complication. When you get called to see the patient in the recovery room or after surgery, and he or she is not responding to pain management, make sure that they don't have an underlying complication like intra-abdominal hemorrhage or compartment syndrome. Always consider the pain severity from 0 to 10 unless it's inappropriate, like age-wise or the patient is not fully um, understanding. Um, check the character of the pain. Is it somatic pain? Is it visceral pain? Is it neuropathic? Consideration when choosing pain management. Look at the patient comorbidities. What's the, what's the past medical history? Any drug allergies? Concomitant medication? Any drug history? Especially um, antidepressant drugs like MAO inhibitors, SSRI. Um, what medications the patient had already received? Look back and look at the record and make sure you don't exceed the toxicity dose and don't repeat the same thing that didn't work in the past. Use a stepwise approach. We're going to talk about that. What route of administration you should use? Should you give oral? Should you give IV? Should you give rectal? What pain modalities can be used at this time? Think the drug potency. Patient preference, always. Use multimodal analgesia. Always be conservative when choosing opioids and continuously give more if needed but start with low dose always document what you gave and make sure you give a good sign out for the upcoming providers always look and monitor for the response and side effect as you see in this uh, step later um, the fundamental drugs which we always should consider the acetaminophen and the NSAIDs. Weak opioid can be used if the patient has moderate pain, and stronger opioid can be reserved for the severe pain. Always remember to use adjuvants that work on the hyperalgesia uh, proprioception uh, pathway. And um, remember to give something that work in the NMDA receptor. So lidocaine, ketamine, highly recommended. 
even if it's not necessarily very good, we would talk about the Lydekin, for example, and even if it's not necessarily very strong analgesic, but um, we have more and more evidence showing that um, it ameliorates the hyperalgesia. The old way of thinking that opioids are the fundamental, then after that you start to add some acetaminophen or ketamine and you can use region anesthesia and the last resort will be the dexmetomidine or lidocaine. However, nowadays this parameter reversed and opioid just at the end of, just at the tip of the pyramid, and at it's the last resort always. So the fundamental, we should always think if we can do regional anesthesia, give acetaminophen and NSAIDs, then consider lidocaine, magnesium, ketamine, dexmetomidine, and finally give opioid. Most postoperative pain is nociceptive in character, but there are a small percentage of patients who can experience neuropathic pain postoperatively. Neuropathic pain is a result of accidental nerve injury, secondary cutting, traction, compression, and so on. Clinical feature may include continuous burning, paroxysmal shooting, or electrical pain with associated allodynia, hyperalgesia, dysthesia. Surgical procedures that are, 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 are has a relatively high risk of neuropathic pain include limb amputation, press surgery, gallbladder, um, thoracic surgery, especially open thoracotomy, inguinal hernia repair. In general, neuropathic pain respond poorly to opioid and may benefit from the addition of non-opioid analgesic adjuvant such as an MDA receptor like ketamine and alpha-2 agonist. Nociceptive uh, uh, pain in general respond well to opioid NSAIDs and regional anal anesthesia. Peroptative pain management modality can be enteral, like oral or rectal, parenteral like IVIM, PCA, intrathecal opioid, epidural analgesia, local infiltration, and regional analgesia on anesthesia. When choosing the route of administration, you should consider the time to the peak effect and the presence of any contraindication to a specific route of administration. For example, patient after esophagectomy, they are strictly in PO for a few days. When, I, when I'm thinking what road of administration I should give, I should, as I mentioned, think about the peak effects. So for example, on average, the IV, the IV uh, route usually peak around six minutes, 10 minutes, um, to a lesser extent, the IM and the slower will be the PO, which is an average will be one hour. So if I need to pay, so I have a pa patient that I need to treat now, treat the pain right now, have a severe pain, so probably IV is the best way to go. If I am before the surgery and I want to give something that um, lasts longer and start to kick in after the surgery, then probably PO is, is a better option. I just give some PO medication uh, before surgery, and when the patient for the surgery and woke up, they have something on board. Always remember that when you give IV versus um, uh, uh, oral, look at the peak. The, uh, the peak is faster reaching in the IV and faster to drop in. So if you look at the time where you have a therapeutic range, it's shorter in, in the IV versus oral. This is why we always recommend to use oral uh, once um, possible. So oral route, as I said, should always be the first option whenever possible. Its, it's main advantage are non-invasive, easy to use, and self-administered. 
Of course, we have to make sure the patient not nauseated, can swallow, and don't throw up. Um, rectal administration, uh, the advantage of absorption from the rectal mucosa is that is largely bypassing the first pass hepatic metabolism. The disadvantage will be similar to the oral, uh, oral administration. Intramuscular, um, in most patients, it is possible to achieve satisfactory analgesia despite major differences in absorption from the site of administration, and even though the administration may be unpleasant and painful. The route of administration should be avoided um, in, in patients with post-operative blood coagulation disorder. An advantage is that it can be used in patients who are uh, incapable of oral intake. Furthermore, parenteral route of administration has a strong placebo effect. Intramuscular administration of opioid is considered um, it should be avoided if possible. Um, IV is the, is the standard and it's the best, fastest onset, more effective and predictable. Uh, the downside that you obviously need um, a venous access. Other modalities that are not that common uh, uh, in the acute post-operative pain, but sometimes can be used. And, and the next thing we would like to think about when we considering which medication I should give is the drug potency. Something very useful to think about when you're considering which drug is more uh, uh, suitable for this patient. Of course, you need to first know the severity of the patient pain. Then if you think about this number need to treat, which is by definition is the number of patients who must be treated to obtain greater than 50% relief of moderate to severe post-operative pain. So the lower the number need to treat, the greater the analgesic effect. I just want you to see here the gabapentin. And this is why I highlighted in red. So it's almost 11. And this probably will explain why most of the studies in clinical trial doesn't really find a, a strong benefit um, in the acute uh, perioperative uh, setting. And then, if you look here, uh, like for example, a gram of, of a gram of acetaminophen is three point eight. However, six milligram, six hundred milligram of ibuprofen is two point four, so it might be more potent. Uh, diclofenac is more potent. Oxycodone, two point five, and and if you increase the dose, um, uh, uh, this is this is oxycodone with uh, acetaminophen. And this is oxycodone um, with a higher dose. But the, the number need to treat are very close if you just give 5 mg plus some Tylenol with it. Um, this, this is the same thing again here. Um, these um, four medications, they are very common and available. This is Tylenol-3, uh, Diclofenac, Ipoprofen, and Naproxen. Um, and they are very uh, good options to treat acute uh, post-operative pain. PCA or patient-controlled analgesia is a method which allows the patient to administer um, uh, the analgesic, mainly opioid here, themselves, most commonly in the vein or the epidural space, although other route of administration have been reported. The beauty of this is that you set up a basic parameters uh, like the, the dose that should be administered, the lookout interval, the maximum uh, dose in, uh, uh, over a certain period of time, like four or six hours, and you, uh, it's generally speaking, it's safe. Compared to other type of systemic opioid administration, the main advantage of PCA are greater patient satisfaction and better quality of analgesia. Side effects are identical to other route of administration. The most commonly used drug, drugs are morphine, hydromorphone, and fentanyl, especially in renal impairment. Mepiridine in general is not recommended for the use of IV uh, PCA, secondary to the accumulation of the potential toxic metabolic uh, norm as 
we talked uh, as as I explained the second lecture lower doses and closer monitoring include continuous pulse ox and intidal carbon dioxide are recommended during the early post-operative period in older adult and in patient at elevated risk of resp for respiratory depression hypoxia opioid accumulation like people with OSA, sleep, um, sleep apnea, morbidly obese, hepatic impairment, and so on. This table summarizes uh, the uh, uh, three most commonly used uh, drugs in PCA, the doses, the loading dose, the lookout time, and the maximum dose uh, uh, over four hours. So for example, the maximum dose of morphine over four hours will be 30 milligrams. Let's talk about epidural. There are a lot of studies and even meta-analysis prove that epidural is superior to systematically um, uh, administered opioid, including PCA, at least for the day of surgery and the next three subsequent days. Advantages of epidural include lower pain scores and uh, um, and less systemic opioid consumption. Cardiovascular, it has been shown that it reduces the risk of myocardial infarction and arrhythmias, especially um, thoracic epidurals. GI, it has been shown that it um, uh, fastens the return of bowel function. Pulmonary, of course, is a big thing, reduces the risk of postoperative pulmonary complication, and many else. When we think about epidural, the efficacy of epidural is determined by four things. Number one, the site of insertion. Number two, the drug that we are using. And number three, the rate of infusion and whether we are using boluses or not. Number four, the duration of epidural. So, as a general rule, um, the site for introducing low thoracic epidural should correspond approximately to the innervation of the center of the surgical incision. While high thoracic epidural, it should correspond to the innervation of the upper pool of the incision. In high thoracic epidural, a greater part of local anesthetic spread in caudal direction. This is why we have to think high thoracic goes with the, with the upper pool of the incision, while lower thoracic um, tend to move uh, cranially. And that's all because of the curvature of the vertebral column. These are some guidelines, rough guidelines, where uh, we uh, should uh, insert the catheter for each type of surgery. And these tables summarize the innervation, um, the, um, the dermatomes and autonomic innervation for different organs and different surgeries. It's very important to consider that when you decide where you're going to place the, the catheter. It's very important also to test if the epidural is working before we start the surgery. So it's a good practice after you insert the catheter to give a testing dose and wait for a little bit and assess the sensory level, make sure it's equal, and, and then um, make sure it's working. Um, it will be challenging to change the epidural or fix it after the surgery is over and you wake up the patient, you realize that the patient is in severe pain, then when are you going to do? Take the catheter and place it back? It will be very challenging. So if you, do, if you do the job, just give it another few minutes and wait before you start. Make sure it's working, it's appropriate, you're happy with it. And if not, then think about alternative early during the course of surgery, not to wait until a few hours of surgery, then you realize, oh, the epidural is not working, it's not in the right place. What am I going to do? Should I put the catheter? Should I put another one? Should I do, use something else? you're going to lose a few hours while a patient is suffering of severe pain. 
Usually the combination of local anesthetic plus opioid um, believe uh, they both work synergistically and uh, they uh, provide the best um, analgesia. Um, it is recommended uh, there is no there is no uh, like a great guidelines for how long we can leave the epidural catheter. You, 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 I've seen patient with epidural for seven days, for two days, for three days, but use it as long as the patient need it. And it, it, is, it is well known that the longer it goes, there is the risk of dislodgement and moving, movement to the catheter will increase. So you may lose it, especially when the patient start to move around. Um, Epidural administered opioid has the distinct advantage of producing analgesia without causing significant sympathetic effect or motor block. So when you have a, 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 a analgesia occurred by um, a way of a spinal mechanism and through a supraspinal mechanism following a systematic absorption, the spinal mechanism occurs following diffusion of the drug into the spinal fluid and is determined by the uh, meningeal uh, permeability. Since opioid alone uh, known to have a less uh, hemodynamic issues. So if you have a patient struggling with blood pressure, continue to be hypotensive despite reducing the con concentration of local, then you may switch to opioid only epidural. Although it will not give you the exact uh, same uh, analgesic effect, but probably it's better than uh, removing the catheter or turning off the, the, the epidural. Again, the concept of um, uh, lipophilicity here is very important to think about. So, drugs that are um, less lipophilic or hydrophilic, um, like morphine and hydromorphone, they tend to uh, uh, have a slower onset of action but longer duration. And the mechanism of action usually primarily spinal in nature. While uh, more lipophilic drugs like uh, fentanyl, so fentanyl, they work faster but for shorter duration and they tend to work primarily supraspinal secondary to the uh, rapid uh, uh, systemic uh, uptake. In the opioid tolerant patient taking more 250 milligram a day of oral morphine, so fentanyl might be a good option actually. Uh, the dose of epidural morphine as a bolus, um, about 2 to 3 milligram uh, for epidural and intrathecal, um, uh, well known that it's stronger than um, uh, epidural administration. We're going to talk about that in the next few slides. Uh, codeine has been uh, uh, reported to be used. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with using codeine. And, um, um, recently, uh, I've seen some studies uh, using the extended uh, release epidural morphine Dipodor uh, that um, has been thought that it, it will work for up to 48 hours. This table summarizes um, some of the common uh, medication that we use for the epidural either as a single uh, bolus dose or infusion. Side effect and complication for neuroaxial, um, as we know, hypertension, inadequate or failure block, uh, pruritus, nausea, urinary retention, vomiting, and respiratory depression is the biggest thing. Let's talk about intrathecal opioid. Intrathecal Intraoperative administration of epidural or intrathecal opioid reduces the need for systematic opioid postoperatively, has been known and documented. For major abdominal surgery with extensive incision, probably epidural is still uh, the gold standard. Uh, with less extensive surgery like laparoscopic, uh, 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 hemicolectomy, or something like that, intrathecal opioid can be used. A single dose of intrathecal spinal opioid can provide substantial pain relief for up to 18 or even 24 hours postoperatively. Intrathecal analgesia with a var uh, variety of drugs 
uh, is a widely accepted practice nowadays. A hydrophilic opioid like morphine penetrate the spinal cord and bind to specific pre- and postsynaptic receptors within the dorsal horn. They traver, uh, they they uh, traverse the dura uh, slowly, bind to uh, epidural fat poorly, and slowly enter the plasma. They tend to have a slower onset, as I said, a longer duration, and this is why delayed respiratory depression is more common with hydrophilic opioid secondary to uh, rostral um, uh, spread. Lipophilic uh, um, uh, opioid like fentanyl tend to bind to nonspecific receptor in the white matter. Uh, again, they are uh, rapid, uh, more rapidly uh, acting and uh, delay respiratory depression is less of a problem with the lipophilic opioid. Intrathecal morphine usually reach the maximum effect within about uh, 45 minutes and as I mentioned it lasts up to 18 or 24 hours while intrathecal fentanyl um, usually peak in 5 to 10 minutes but um, usually lasts for about uh, 1 to 2 hours. And this table summarizes um, some of the differences uh, between uh, lipophilic and hydrophilic opioid when used uh, uh, neuroaxial. Anything we administer intrathecal, it's very important to make sure it's preservative free. Look, for example, here it's mentioned preservative free duramorphs. There is no preservative free here. Sometimes they put uh, a PF, so make sure before you give the drug it's preservative free. Other useful analgesic addition include alpha-2 um, uh, agonist. Uh, clonidine has been reported to be used and should less um, uh, respiratory depression and pruritus. Uh, intrathecal dose of 150 mic um, are reported, and uh, but uh, there is some issue with uh, increasing um, uh, incidence of uh, hypotension, bradycardia, and even nausea. The incidence of respiratory depression from opioid is not significantly different among various routes of administration. Therefore, appropriate monitoring of patient receiving opioid analgesic is ex uh, essential to detect those with opioid-related side effects such as respiratory depression. Delayed respiratory depression due to um, rostral spread of opioid to the respiratory center in medulla is possible with epidural or intrathecal and respiratory depression may occur up to 18 hours after hydrophilic agent. The incidence of delayed respiratory depression is approximately 0.1 at a dose of 200 micromorphine. This is um, a new um, guidelines and consideration um, that just been published um, for the use of neuroaxial opioid analgesia um, in low resource environment and I found it to be um, um, good within the contents of the lectures that I'm, I'm presenting. Example of patient and post-operative risk factor for respiratory depression. Um, this is um, specifically to obstetric population, but I believe it can be generalized to other population. So if you notice in the perioperative, um, if you have a general anesthesia or desaturation during PACU stay, concomitant administration of IV opioid or sedative or magnesium, if you have a patient with cardiopulmonary or neurological comorbidities or morbidly obese patient, patient with OSA or chronic opioid use or hypertension, these are the patients at higher risk of respiratory depression after neuroaxial, specifically intrathecal opioid administration. So these are the, the recommendations from the soup task. And um, 
you can look at this table uh, this is an algorithm that um, make it a little bit more easier so if you have a patient with low risk healthy patient um, then it depends on the dose that you are giving so we're talking about morphine here um, if you are giving um, a dose that most commonly given like 150 mic of morphine intrathecally or 1 to 3 milligram of um, morphine epidurally this is considered low dose so you should monitor for respiratory depression and monitor the vital sign every two hours for 12 hours if we are giving an ultra short ultra low dose like 50 mic of morphine or one milligram epidurally then probably routine post-operative vital sign monitoring with no additional respiratory monitoring probably uh, enough however if you're giving uh, a higher dose or if your patient have other risk factors, as I mentioned in the previous slide, then you better go with more um, uh, frequent observation for respiratory rate, uh, like every one hour for 12, hour, 12 hours, then every two hours for uh, 12 to uh, 24 hours. Infiltration or local infiltration. Um, this is, um, um, an easily administered uh, uh, modality. The surgeon can do it, anyone can do it, uh, mainly at the end of the surgery, uh, and it should be um, uh, used whenever other modalities like epidural or regional cannot be used. You can use uh, infiltration and an analgesia. Um, I, I place the link here for um, YouTube uh, video that showed how what's the best way to do uh, an infiltration analgesia and um, it's recommended by many references to add uh, a vasoconstrictor like epinephrine unless contraindicated uh, to the local to uh, slightly increase the duration typically we put five mic per mil which uh, give us um, a concentration of uh, one in two hundred thousand um, the, the, uh, the usually in dental surgery they use a slightly higher dose uh, to end up with one in an eighty thousand uh, epinephrine should not be used in a ring block or uh, of digit or in the penis or in other situation where there is a danger of local ischemia um, let's talk about some properties of local anesthetic. So local anesthetic in general bind to voltage gated uh, sodium channel um, and um, inhibit uh, the formation of action potential. Sensitivity to local anesthetic differ depend on the type of nerve fiber. In general, thinner fibers are more sensitive with the same diameter when it's the same diameter, a myelinated axon will be blocked earlier than a myelinated one. So, um, thin autonomic and uh, uh, um, sensory uh, A delta and C fiber carry pain and temperature are blocked first. Uh, only then, thicker like A alpha and A beta and A gamma fiber uh, convey the touch, pressure, per perception, and motor are inhibited and this is very important when you assess your spinal your epidural your nerve block uh, uh, to understand this concept so when you examine you should expect that the temperature goes first not the motor goes first for example uh, the uh, anesthetic potency is mainly subjected to the liposolubility as we mentioned previously however the the speed of onset of the block is influenced by many factors the most important being the pka coefficient this coefficient expresses the relationship between a non-ionized form of local anesthetic and its ionized form local anesthetic with the pka closest to the physiologic pH, pH, 
will have a higher concentration uh, concentration of the non-ionized form in the tissue, penetrate the cell membrane more easily, and generally have a faster onset of action. The duration of a block is determined primarily by binding to plasma protein, as well as the lipophilicity of the local anesthetic and by adding uh, vasoconstrictors or not. These are the most commonly used um, uh, local anesthetic, lidocaine, pubivacaine, uh, levopubivacaine, and rubivacaine. And I, I placed here some basic information about uh, the duration of action, the toxicity, and uh, some uh, important difference, differences between them. Um, when you go and try to find out uh, dosing, um, you will find um, different different uh, ref references have slightly different dosing, and and I think this is mainly because we really don't have a good studies on what is the toxic dose. These are mainly uh, mainly um, observational studies or studies from animals, and 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 this is why we don't have a legit science to say oh this is that real toxic dose however as a rule of thumb with anything in medicine go with the safest which is the lowest uh, as you notice when you add epinephrine you uh, not only increase the duration of action as you see here but you also allow yourself to use a, a higher dose so it's very important to um, memorize these doses and and memorize the onset of action and the duration so when you give any local anesthetic whatever the route um, IV infiltration uh, intraarticular uh, wherever you should uh, always uh, uh, think about the toxic uh, maximum dose otherwise you may have a systemic toxicity and this can lead to cardiac arrhythmias, cardiovascular collapse, uh, seizures, and so on. In general, allergic reactions to local anesthetic are very rare. Many of the reported reactions have a different underlying pathophysiological mechanism, um, like vagal syncope, for example, but the patient think they had allergy. Allergic reactions are for the most part associated with uh, esters, mainly because the presence of the uh, 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 paraamino benzoic acid derivative. Uh, due to their different structure, there is no allergic cross reaction between the two groups, between the amino and the esters. Um, the diagnosis is based on the presence of the following symptoms in order of severity, hypotension shock, cardiac arrest, arrhythmia, uh, erythema, bronchospasm, angioedema, and skin symptoms. In the same context will be the last, which is the local anesthetic systemic toxicity. These are some um, uh, alarming, alarming uh, uh, symptoms and signs that uh, should uh, make you think that um, this patient uh, might have um, uh, start to have a last uh, um, presentation for last. Um, as uh, most of us know, uh, enterolipid is the mainstay for treatment. Usually, you start by a bolus dose of 1.5 milligram, uh, sorry, mil per kilogram. Uh, if you if you make the math, usually it's one bag, it's about 200, 250, um, and you in adult in in 70 kilogram adult, so uh, you give that over uh, 15, 20 minutes, then uh, you can repeat it or better use an infusion uh, until the symptoms subside. Remember, uh, propofol although it has uh, intralipid, but is not. An option here because it will cause more hemodynamic instability. And the and the and the big thing that remember, although you apply the, the rest of the ACLS uh, 
uh, guidelines, but uh, epinephrine boluses way lower than um, other causes of code. And uh, it's typically one mic per kilogram. Um, and then avoid uh, vasopressin, calcium chain blocker, beta blocker, and using, of course, your anesthetic. You should stop that immediately. Um, other supportive measures like oxygen, bagging, and of course, um, continue monitoring the patient for quite a few hours and um, until you make sure that all the toxicity um, is gone. Um, again, um, regional anesthesia and analgesia. It's a great thing. It's a superior analgesic mood to uh, uh, almost all everything else. Uh, um, and um, it has uh, a lot of advantages. Probably the most disadvantage that really need a trained person and not available everywhere. Um, regional anesthesia is beyond the scope of this course. Let's talk about multimodal analgesia or NMA. You will see it sometimes. And its implication for enhanced recovery after surgery, ERAS. You remember this um, uh, graph from the first presentation when I showed you the four elements of pain processing, transduction, transmission, modulation, and perception. So when we want to make the plan for pain management, we should think about how we can um, attack all these four elements. And as you can see, uh, different medication actually work at a different level. For example, non can, uh, you can uh, it can work at the transduction and modulation level. Opioid, for example, can work at um, transduction and uh, uh, perception. Um, peripheral nerve block inhibit the uh, transmission. The optimal strategy for multiple, uh, multimodal analgesia uh, and the ultimate goal to um, minimize um, uh, the use of opioid and maximize the use of non-opioid and, of course, um, um, give the patient the best uh, um, analgesic. Um, this table uh, summarizes um, uh, um, general uh, approaches for different commonly um, ser common surgeries like for example thoracotomy think about systemic local regional neuroaxia always give um, uh, Tylenol NSAID uh, ketamine plus minus gabapentin and consider paravertebral block if it's uh, unilateral or epidural if it's bilateral or if you cannot put uh, a para, paravertebral block. And you can see for each surgery, you, you always think about, again, systematic, uh, where, we, where we should give, uh, make sure we have a multimodal analgesia here. Uh, can we give something local? Uh, can we give regional? Can we use neuroaxial technique? So pain control regime should be tailored to the need of individual patient. Um, and when you think, uh, when you make the plan, take into account the patient age, medical and physical condition, level of fear and anxiety, personal preferences, type of surgical procedure and response. Uh, regional anesthesia seems to be the best preventive analges analgesia. Uh, again, always use the fundamental medication like NSAIDs, uh, Tylenol, and, um, and it's advised to be given orally even before the surgery. Why not? Before you take the patient back, um, give them the medication with a sip of water and let them be absorbed and peak in the system during the surgery. So when you wake up your patient, you already have this medication on board. Uh, following uh, minimally invasive intra-abdominal uh, surgical procedure, you can do a tab block, paravertebral, inefacial block like QL, um, erector spinae, uh, or local infiltration. You, you may, if you cannot, you can use lidocaine infusion, 
uh, PCA, and etc. For major, then probably again neuroaxial technique like epidural uh, and or um, lidocaine with ketamine infusion might be a good option here. Um, this is the website for the ERA Society guidelines. Uh, check it out. There, there are a lot of guidelines for uh, different surgeries, very useful, and they talk about uh, different modalities and, and, and plan for pain management. But the same concepts that I taught you during this course and during this lecture will apply. Recently, um, very recently, uh, the American Society for uh, Enhanced Recovery and Perioperative Quality Initiative joined consensus statement on perioperative uh, opioid minimization in opioid naive patient just published. Um, the committee proposed three questions. What are the potential strategies for preventing persistent postoperative opioid use? Comprehensive multimodal analgesia care plan with the aim of uh, minimizing or avoiding uh, post-discharge uh, opioid use with patient education, tailored uh, 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 pre-op risk-based uh, strategy, getting uh, setting expectation for expected pain and opioid use trajectory. And the second question, is opioid-free anesthesia and analgesia feasible and appropriate for routine operation? And the answer is yes, it's feasible and maybe, um, maybe an, an appropriate perioperative strategy. Then the last question, is opioid-free intraoperative anesthesia associated with equivalent or superior outcome compared to an opioid minimization in the perioperative period? There is no sub substantive uh, um, uh, literature comparing intraoperative opioid-free anesthesia to opioid minimizing strategy. Non-opioid analgesic have advantage and disadvantage. Um, this is another table from another um, uh, uh, review article. Um, sorry, it's not very clear, but basically, the author suggested um, what you give if you expect your surgery to be less than two hours versus more than two hours. I think it's very useful. As you see, Tylenol and ibuprofen orally, preoperatively, always given in the holding area. With gabapentin, they give, they give Celeprex. Intraoperatively, if it's a short surgery, uh, probably ketamine bolus is enough. If it's longer than two hours, based on the type of surgery, then uh, you may use infusion, lidocaine the same, uh, dexmetomidine for longer surgery can be used, magnesium, and uh, in, in PACU, uh, these are the doses of um, opioid. Finally, let's um, uh, wrap up here. We're talking about uh, management of pain in resource-limited setting. And again, that was one of my uh, major objectives to cover during this course. In 2007, and this is interesting, the International Association for the Study of Pain, IASP, conducted a survey of members in resource-limited setting, revealing that while approximately 50% of respondents had received education related to pain management, over 90%, over 90% felt that it was insufficient. So it seems that education ranks as the number one barrier to good pain management. And this is what drives me to give these lectures. Um, another thing here that the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists uh, established what is called the Safer Anesthesia from Education course, which basically cover pediatric and obstetric anesthesia. I put the link here for you. It's a PDF uh, 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 book. You can uh, download it. Uh, I think it's very useful and simple. They also um, developed something uh, electronic 
called e -saf or e -saf, uh, the uh, safer anesthesia uh, from education and this is the link for the uh, for the for the website it's free and there is over than 100 interactive e-learning sessions very useful videos when considering pain management strategies in resource-limited setting, the following rules, these are the rules that I really would like you to think about always. Think about something inexpensive and uh, always available. Think about something that requires minimal monitoring. So if I'm gonna give an intrathecal opioid, for example, I probably give 50 mic, not 150 or 200 for sure. Um, think safety first. Safe and minimal possible life-threatening side effect. And this is another reason why you really should avoid as much as you can giving opioid and resource limited uh, setting. You don't have good monitor, you don't have enough people to watch your patient, and you, in many places they don't even have analog zone. Easily implementable um, uh, by staff and minimal training after that. So this is why um, region anesthesia is a great thing, uh, but in many um, uh, resource limited setting, uh, people are not trained to do that. And um, even training uh, requires a lot of time and training and preparation. So think about something alternative and easier. The WHO in 2017, uh, listed few uh, medications and call them these are the essential medicine um, that should be uh, available uh, everywhere, especially in resource limited um, uh, setting. These are the uh, local anesthetic, paracetamol, opioid including codeine, fentanyl, and morphine, and NSAIDs like ibuprofen and ketamine. So even if you are in low resource uh, 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 setting, um, you still have these five, and you always can think about pain management modalities using these five. This is a suggested analgesic regime in uh, resource uh, limited setting. Um, again, if we're gonna give intrathecal, give low dose, always preservative free. Um, you can use tab block, it's an easy block. Uh, if not, you can use wound infiltration. Always give paracetamol, always give NSAIDs, um, and use uh, low uh, um, uh, opioid. You can use morphine here, for example, and intraoperative IV ketamine considered in selected uh, patient and give uh, pre uh with a relatively low dose. Um, here again, uh, we were talking about um, uh, intrathecal morphine. I just want you to, to, to know this is 50 mic of uh, morphine, not 50 milligram. This is a typo. And if you're gonna give it uh, epidurally, uh, you, you, uh, the safest to give one milligram or less. This is my last slide, and I want to demonstrate for you that um, by using just two simple and, and very inexpensive and always available two medication, uh, paracetamol and ibuprofen, if you schedule them for the first, let's say, couple of days um, after surgery, when you really have the, um, the most severe pain, if you schedule them every six hours alternating, then your patient will take a pain management every three hours and, and, and have a good uh, covered uh, basic analgesia. Then if you do that, then you can give something PRN once required, uh, like let's say um, uh, opioid, whatever you have. So remember always start before surgery, give uh, some oral medication cocktail um, and schedule this for the, let's say for the first one, two, three days based on the severity of pain and the complexity of surgery, switch to PRN as soon as possible. And again, I would like to stress again and again, it is very crucial that the anesthesia, surgery, and nursing, they work together as a team when it comes to pain management. 
please communicate, please talk to each other, please help each other to, for the sake of the patient, to give your patient the best uh, pain management. These are more, um, these are my references plus whatever I uh, inserted in uh, certain slides. And thank you for your attention. I hope you will find this course useful.